Hello and welcome to Front Runner Motorsport. We have looked at and listed every Ferrari Formula One driver ever. We have also looked at and listed every Williams Formula One driver ever. And now we are going to look at and list every McLaren Formula One driver ever, from their first race in 1966 to current times. Every driver who has ever entered by the Works McLaren team will be put in order on how they got on with the Woking-based racing team, and not the rest of their motorsport careers. There are 51 drivers between 1966 and 2022, so we better get started on part one. Make sure you subscribe not to miss out on the next two parts, and with that, let's begin. Number 51, Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 51, Stephen South. I bet you haven't even heard of Stephen South, but he was the talk of the town during his Formula 4 days. His biggest career success was winning the British Formula 3 Championship in 1977, as well as taking race wins in European Formula 2 for the Ron Dennis Ran Project 4 team. He got his big break into Formula 1 when Alan Prost had a big break on his wrist. South was actually second choice to former champion James Hunt, who was set to be paid a million pounds to come back for one race. He decided to go skiing, broke his leg whilst drunk, and South was called up. Unfortunately, McLaren were not on the pace in 1980, so Stephen South's one chance in Formula 1 led to being eliminated in pre-qualifying, six seconds off the pace. After that, his career went south and ended with a leg amputation after a crash in Canada in the Can-Am series. Number 50, Nanny Gali. The Italian had actually been an endurance racer before he went on to make a few appearances in Formula 1. Nanny Galli made his Formula 1 debut and single McLaren appearance at the 1970 Italian Grand Prix. Like Stephen South, he failed to qualify for the race one and a half seconds off making the grid. He would at least get a taste of F1 action, making appearances for March in 1971, Techno and Ferrari in 1972, and for Frank Williams' team in 1973. He never scored any points, with a ninth place in Brazil in 1973 with Frank Williams being his best result. Number 49, Derek Bell. Another famous endurance racer, the five-time 24 Hours of Le Mans winner, had a smattering of Formula 1 appearances in the late 60s and early 70s. He actually made his debut in 1968 with Ferrari, but failed to finish in both his appearances. His one McLaren appearance came in 1969. He was the third ever McLaren driver, and at the British Grand Prix, he qualified near the back of the grid and retired five laps in with suspension issues. He would later score a single Formula 1 point with Team Surtees, but will always be more well known for his endurance racing success with the Rothmans Porsche team. His Formula 1 career is very forgettable. Number 48, Philippe Alio. The Frenchman was a very good race driver and never really got the chances in Formula 1 he deserved. He had been racing in Formula 1 since 1984, mostly with teams at the back of the grid, from Skull Bandit to Ligier and LaRousse. Alio had scored the odd points finish, but his career had basically petered out, and after scoring two points for LaRousse in 1993, it seemed like his Formula 1 career was done. But he was called back to Formula 1 with a drive for McLaren in Hungary in 1994. This was due to the McLaren Peugeot engines and Mika Hakkinen's suspension. Philip Alio qualified in the midfield and broke down mid-race with a water leak. He had one final race for LaRousse at the next round, but then was done for good with Formula 1. He found success in sports car racing and even raced for Peugeot in the French touring cars. He retired in the mid 2000s. Number 47, Nigel Mansell. God knows why Nigel Mansell signed with McLaren in 1995. He was already retired from Formula 1 after 1992 and only returned because of the death of Alton Senna. He is the first driver on this list who has been in all three of his ranking every driver videos. He was first in the Williams list and 25th for Ferrari. Well, for McLaren, he slips all the way down to 47th. It was an embarrassing disaster. His start with the team was delayed because he didn't fit in the car, and when he did drive it, it didn't go well for him. At Imola, he was as high as 6th late in the race before making contact with Eddie Irvine, and at the Spanish Grand Prix, he decided the car was so bad, he was going to retire from Formula 1 again. McLaren would have been better off if he stayed at home. Number 46, Jan Magnussen. The father of Kevin Magnussen, who we will see later on this list, 
Jan Magnussen only had a single race for McLaren at the 1995 Pacific Grand Prix. Deputising for Mika Hakkinen, who was recovering from appendicitis, the 1994 British Formula 3 champion was actually making his Formula 1 debut and did alright. He qualified okay and finished the race at least. He was young, McLaren weren't competitive so he did everything that was asked of him. He would later have a year and a half with Stuart Ford but didn't impress and went on to find success in the Danish Touring Car Championship and in American sports car racing. He's still racing, spending 2022 competing in the Scandinavian Porsche Carrera Cup. Number 45, Andrea de Adamic. Thanks to a brief deal McLaren had with Alfa Romeo to supply engines for a third works car, Andrea de Adamic got to race with the team in 1970. The Alfa Romeo powered McLaren was far worse than its Ford counterparts, and Andrea de Adamic only finished a couple of times out of his 10 entries, even failing to qualify for half of those races. He followed Alfa Romeo to March in 1971 and later joined Team Surtees and Brabham, but had little success in Formula 1. His career incidentally was ended by a McLaren causing a crash that injured de Adamic and he retired after 1973. Number 44, Gilles Villeneuve. I've spoken about this before, but Gilles Villeneuve, famous for his time at Ferrari and a contender for greatest driver never to be world champion, actually made his debut for McLaren. It was his Formula 1 debut and his only start not in a Ferrari. It was the 1977 British Grand Prix and Gilles Villeneuve was pretty anonymous and could have disappeared without anyone knowing. But he resurfaced with Ferrari at year's end and was taking his first win in Formula 1 a year later. Shame we never got to see his full potential. Number 43, Jody Schechter. The man driving the McLaren that injured Andrea de Adamic was future Formula 1 champion Jody Schechter. He made his debut with McLaren and in just six appearances in 1972 and 1973, he finished twice and retired four times. To be fair, he was driving a third McLaren and wasn't all that fast. But in a couple of those drives, Schechter was running high up the field and may have had a chance to win in the French Grand Prix of 1973, but mistakes led to poor results. The South African would later go on to have a very successful Formula 1 career, first with Tyrrell, then Walter Wolf Racing, and finally Ferrari and the Formula 1 Championship before his early retirement. Number 42, David Hobbs. Seven Grand Prix starts was all David Hobbs got in Formula 1, and he looks on paper like a decent driver. He raced in everything from the British Touring Cars to the Indy 500. He made his debut with Bernard Wright Racing in 1967, but also made appearances for Lola, Honda and Penske before two drives with McLaren in 1974. Like all his Grand Prix results, he was consistent but not in the points. He finished 7th in Austria and 9th in Italy. Outside of Formula 1, he has podiums at Le Mans, a 5th place at the 1974 Indy 500 and a whole lot of experience in a variety of series. He really deserved a full-time shot at Formula 1, but sadly, he never got it. Number 41, Bruno Giacomelli. Another Italian who made his Formula 1 debut with McLaren thanks to his backing by Marlborough. He made six appearances during 1977 and 1978 and scored no points. He got his best result in 1978 at the British Grand Prix with seventh, but would go on to win the European Formula 2 Championship that year and raced for the Marlborough-backed Alfa Romeo works team for a few years, getting a podium in 1981 before seeing his Formula 1 career out with backmarkers like Tolman and the Life team who he never qualified for a race for. Number 40, Dan Gurney. The four-time Formula 1 race winner took part in just three races for McLaren and they were his final appearances in Formula 1 in 1970, having began his career in 1959. After racing in an Anglo-American customer McLaren in 1968, Gurney made a few appearances as a temporary replacement for the sadly deceased Bruce McLaren. He didn't finish two of the races but managed to finish sixth in the French Grand Prix and claimed his final Formula 1 point. Number 39, Jackie Oliver. The former Lotus and BRM driver raced in three Grand Prix for McLaren in 1971 and was competent at best. A best seventh at the Italian Grand Prix and no points. He would have some minor success with Shadows as well as winning the 1974 Can-Am Championship before going on to be part of the group that formed the Arrows Formula 1 team that would be a stable of the grid for over 20 years, with as much success as Jackie Oliver managed in his career. Number 38, Andrea De Cesaris. The Italian is probably most remembered for retiring from a lot of races and his single season with McLaren was one of the years where he managed to finish the highest percentage of races, finishing 6 of 15. 1981 was his first full year in Formula 1, after making a couple of appearances for Alfa Romeo in 1980. He was completely outclassed by teammate John Watson, 
Andrea Cesaris only scored one point at Imola. It was a year too soon as McLaren were more competitive in 1982, but Cesaris would have a long career, racing for 10 different teams between 1980 and 1994. He even scored points for 9 of those 10 teams, but his season at McLaren was a wasted opportunity for both parties and Cesaris was replaced by little known Nicky Lauda in 1982. Number 37, Sergio Perez. This seemed like a dream come true for Sergio Perez. After impressing for Sauber in 2011 and 2012, the Mexican was hired by McLaren to replace Lewis Hamilton. Sadly, McLaren were declining and far off their best. Sergio Perez did score points, but his best finish was fifth in India. He finished 2013 in 11th place in the championship. He did better with Sauber in 2012, when he finished 10th overall. He was unceremoniously dumped by McLaren and moved to Force India, where he would spend the next eight years, finally taking his first win at Sakhir in 2020. He got another chance to race at the front with Red Bull in 2021 and is still with the energy drink sponsored team and has four wins under his belt in Formula 1 so far. I guess it all worked out in the end. Number 36, Brian Redman. A sports car racer masquerading as a Formula 1 driver, Brian Redman never had a full season in Formula 1, instead making 15 sporadic appearances between 1967 and 1974, including three drives for McLaren. He did well for the team, he finished 5th twice, which outside of a podium with BRM in 1968, was his only points in Formula 1. Brian Redman also made appearances for BRM in 1972 but failed to finish, and would have a few drives for the Shadow Team in 1974, but his motorsport success mostly came in sports car racing where he even spent time as a works driver for Ferrari and Alfa Romeo. Number 35, Stoffel Van Dorn. The 2021 Formula E champion had a bad time with McLaren. That was down to McLaren having a bad time with new engine partners Honda. Van Dorn made his debut as a stand-in for Fernando Alonso in 2016, scoring a point and getting a full-time drive for 2017. In the next two seasons, he only managed 7 points finishes in 41 races and finished 16th in the standings in both 2017 and 2018. Poor results for a McLaren who had used to winning, Van Dorn was replaced for 2019 and moved to Formula E with Mercedes, where he has won 3 races and a championship. Number 34, Peter Geffen. For a direct replacement for Bruce McLaren, Peter Geffen made 14 appearances for the team in 1970 and 1971. He failed to finish 9 of those races. He did score just one point for McLaren, but usually finished just outside the points. He took his first win in 1971 after leaving McLaren and joining BRM. That win was one of just three points finishes in Formula 1 and a bit of a shock. But he did a decent job at McLaren under difficult circumstances. Number 33, Alexander Wurtz. The current chairman of the Grand Prix Drivers Association began his Formula 1 career all the way back in 1997 with Benetton after racing in the International Touring Car Championship and winning the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1996. Wurtz made his Formula 1 debut with Benetton, standing in for the ill Gerhard Berger. Wurtz impressed in his three races getting a podium at Silverstone and he was given a full-time race seat for 1998 and spent the next few years with the team as results got worse and worse before he was replaced by Jensen Button ahead of the 2001 season. He signed on as a test driver for McLaren and made one appearance for the team, which became a third place at Imola after the BAR Hondas were disqualified. His podium in 1997 and this one are the longest gaps between podiums in F1 history. It was a decent drive and Wurtz almost got a full-time race seat for McLaren to replace Mika Hakkinen, but they went for Raikkonen instead. Considering it was Kimi Raikkonen in a Ferrari that beat McLaren in 2007, maybe they should have chose Alexander Wurtz. He would later go on to have a final full season in Formula 1 with Williams in 2007, as well as taking a second win with Peugeot at Le Mans. Wurtz was a very good driver who has been involved with Formula 1 for a long time, but only one race for McLaren. Number 32, Jackie Ix. One of the greatest drivers ever, but he too only got a single drive for McLaren, and he too finished it on the podium. This was in between racing for Ferrari in 1973. By this point, Jackie Ix was heading towards the latter half of his time in Formula 1. He had debuted in 1966 and by this point had won his eight Formula 1 Grand Prix. Most of those wins had come for Ferrari and Ix was also successful in sports car racing for the Scuderia. But in 1973, Ferrari were not competitive in Formula 1 and decided to skip the Nürburgring. Ix was perturbed by this and raced for McLaren. 
taking third place which incidentally was his best result of 1973. He returned to Ferrari one last time at Monza before joining Frank Williams for the final race of the year. He would finish his career with Lotus, Williams, Walter Wolf, Ensign and Lotus, whilst also winning the Dakar and Le Mans a couple more times. Jackie X won so much in his time in Formula 1, truly one of the greatest of all time and a shame he only had a single appearance for McLaren. Number 31, Michael Andretti. The signing of an Andretti in 1993 was a big deal for McLaren. It brought back memories of Mario Andretti winning races for Lotus back in the 70s. Sadly, Michael Andretti did not take to Formula 1 as well as his father. Michael Andretti was no slouch. He was a kart series champion and was runner-up in the series five times, either side of his brief time in Formula 1. In total, he took 42 wins in the kart series, as well as getting on the podium of the Indy 500 three times, never winning it outright. He was also on the podium at Le Mans in 1983 and was by 1993 an experienced race driver, but crucially, not in Europe. That, along with new testing rules limiting his track time prior to Grand Prix, did the most damage to his Formula 1 chances. He didn't know the tracks or the car very well. Formula 1 had a lot of gadgetry that differed from the kart series like traction control and active suspension. Michael Andretti crashed a lot on his first few starts. He crashed in South Africa, Brazil and then twice with Carl Wendlinger's Sauber at Donington Park and Imola. He would finally score points in Spain, but was lapped by teammate Ayrton Senna in the process. He would only score further points in the French Grand Prix and his final start at the Italian Grand Prix, which, despite a spin, ended with a podium. Despite all the problems and crashes, given more time, Michael Andretti could have made this work, but he refused to move to Europe and didn't get to grips with the car quickly enough. He agreed to leave before year's end and was replaced by Mika Hakkinen. He had more success in America before retiring and becoming a team owner making Andretti one of the best teams in various series around the world. And clearly, he has unfinished business with F1, currently trying to get the FIA to allow Andretti to join the grid in 2026. Number 30, Patrick Tombay. The sadly recently deceased Patrick Tombay had a decent time in Formula 1 with Ferrari, but he chose to drive for McLaren at a bad time. They were not very competitive in 1978, with even former champion James Hunt struggling to score points. Tombay got a smattering of points here and there and managed to equal the same amount as Hunt who left the team and Formula 1 thereafter. In 1979, Patrick Tombay was partnered by John Watson and even though both drivers struggled throughout the season, Watson did score points, whilst Tombay did not. He left McLaren and went back to Can-Am racing in 1980, winning his second championship there before returning in 1981 and taking wins with Ferrari in 1982. A very good driver, unfortunate timing was his downfall at McLaren who were not competitive for two years Tombe drove for them and it was very sad to hear of his passing. Number 29, Mark Blundell. He was supposed to be a stand-in whilst a big enough car was prepared for Nigel Mansell but after Mansell threw his toys out of the pram and left McLaren, Blundell got to finish the season for them. It wasn't great, he only scored points at six races for a total of 13 but that's not too bad if you consider he wasn't supposed to be in the car. He scored a point on his debut in Brazil and on his return at Monaco we have a fifth place. His best results were fourth in Italy and Australia and he finished the year on 13 points. It doesn't sound amazing but McLaren's star driver Mika Hakkinen only managed 17 that year. This was their first year with Mercedes engines and things were only going to get better from here but that was without Mark Blundell. This was Blundell's final season in Formula 1 having previously raced for Brabham, Ligier and Tyrrell. He got a few podiums in his time, but never really accomplished consistent results. He'd head to America and win a few races in the kart series before retiring from full-time racing in 2000, making a single season return in 2019 in an Audi in the British Touring Cars. Number 28, Kevin Magnussen. A second place on his debut in Formula 1 at the 2014 Australian Grand Prix is the best result Kevin Magnussen has ever had in Formula 1, literally downhill after race 1. That includes his season with McLaren. He scored points at most races, but only in the low end of the points, with his next best result being fifth at the Russian Grand Prix. He was dumped by McLaren, but was set to stand in for Fernando Alonso at the opening round in 2015. Unfortunately, the engine failed on a formation lap and he didn't make the start. With his brief time at McLaren over, Magnussen joined Renault and later Haas, never hitting the podium again, at least so far. He was dumped by Haas at the end of 2020, but returned to replace a disgraced Nikita Mazepin in 2022 
and had a pretty good season. He's all set to go again in 2023. Hopefully he can finish higher than ninth in the championship. So far, his best finish. Number 27, Pedro De La Rosa. Another stand-in reserve driver, but one who had a few more races and did a very good job. Pedro De La Rosa had a couple of years in Formula 1 with Arrows, followed by a couple with Jaguar, but did not achieve good results with either team. He joined McLaren as a test driver in 2003 and made his first start with the team in 2005 after Juan Pablo Montoya injured his shoulder. De La Rosa finished fifth in Bahrain and set the lap record which stands to this day. He replaced Montoya for the end of the 2006 season after the former caused chaos and burnt bridges. He did a really good job for the team scoring 19 points in just 8 races, including an amazing second place in Hungary. Six years later he was considered impressive enough to race for Sauber and later for HRT in 2012. He retired from active racing after that but has done testing work in Formula E and for Pirelli. Number 26 Keke Rosberg The four-time race winner and 1982 Formula 1 champion joined McLaren for his final year in 1986. He never really got used to the car which was developed more towards teammate Alan Prost. KK Rosberg also retired from a lot of races including the final race in Australia which he was dominating. A rear tyre went and Rosberg mistook the noise for an engine failure and pulled off the road, retiring the car when it just needed a tyre change. Outside of Australia his best race was at Monaco where he finished second behind Prost for a McLaren 1-2. After leaving Formula 1 he raced in sports cars and DTM taking wins in both and later would watch as his son took the Formula 1 title in 2016, making them only the second father-son champions behind Graham and Damon Hill. Number 25, Mike Halewood. Speaking of final seasons, this was the end of Mike Halewood's career. He raced for most of the 1974 season and helped McLaren to take their first ever Constructors' Championship. Mike Halewood had won nine World Championships in bike racing, but never won a Formula 1 Grand Prix, taking podiums with Team Surtees and McLaren at South Africa. He took 12 points from McLaren before an injury at the German Grand Prix led to his retirement from racing. He returned to bike racing sporadically in the late 70s before his sad and untimely death in 1981 after a collision with a lorry that also took the life of his 9-year-old daughter Michelle. Number 24, Martin Brundle. After an impressive spell with Benetton in 1992 and Ligier in 1993, Martin Brundle replaced Ayrton Senna at McLaren in 1994, getting the nod ahead of test driver Philip Alio, just a couple of weeks before the season starts in Brazil. Unfortunately, it was a bad season for McLaren. The new Peugeot V10 engines weren't up to scratch and the car was unreliable. Brundle lost out on a couple of good results because of engine failures and a big crash in Brazil with Jos Verstappen. The high point was a second place at Monaco following Michael Schumacher home and he did score a podium in the final race in Australia but was replaced for 1995 by Nigel Mansell which proved to be a really bad idea. Brundle would see out his career racing for the Ligier and Jordan teams and racing at Le Mans before becoming one of the most well-known and popular commentators in Formula 1 history. Number 23, Heike Kovalainen. I never really thought that highly of Heike Kovalainen but apparently McLaren did when they signed him to replace Fernando Alonso in 2008. He had performed very well in his first Formula 1 season with Renault and even got a second place in Japan, but I think McLaren hired him because of their previous success with Finnish drivers. He was always going to be the number 2 driver next to Lewis Hamilton, but I think what damaged Kovalainen's career was that in 2008 McLaren had a race winning car and Kovalainen did take a win in Hungary, but over the season he didn't do much better than he had in a Renault in 2007, finishing 7th in the championship both times. In 2009, McLaren were caught out by the new regulations and often struggled for pace. Even Lewis Hamilton had a bad time. Kovalainen only scored points at seven races, never getting on the podium and finishing the year 12th. He was replaced by Jensen Button and moved to the new Team Lotus for 2010. He spent a few years at the back with the team that would eventually be called Caterham before making a couple of final appearances for a different Lotus team. He left Formula 1, raced in Super GT in Japan and won the championship in 2016. He raced in Japan till 2021 and did very little in 2022, just a single WRC appearance. Kovalainen had an uninspired time at McLaren, but did take a win and possibly his best year in Formula 1, but McLaren ended up damaging the Finns career and he has never really recovered. Number 22, Daniel Ricciardo. The Australian has a very similar story to Heike Kovalainen, except his best years were already behind him. It is similar in that he spent two years at McLaren and it has done untold damage to his reputation. 
Daniel Ricciardo was already a serial race winner with Red Bull and joined McLaren off the back of two decent seasons with Renault. Immediately, it looked like a bad idea. Lando Norris destroyed him in the early part of 2021. When Lando Norris took his third podium of the year in Austria, he was in contention for third in the championship. Meanwhile, Ricciardo had not finished higher than fifth. It was a shock then when Daniel Ricciardo won the Italian Grand Prix ahead of his teammate in the McLaren 1-2. This was to be the only time Daniel Ricciardo climbed the podium for McLaren and he finished the year 8th, 45 points behind his teammate. 2022 was the end for Ricciardo. McLaren didn't want him anymore and have replaced him with a younger Australian. And Ricciardo did not perform well ending the year 11th. He is now a reserve driver at Red Bull. 21. Stefan Johansson he was literally signed as a one-season solution whilst McLaren waited for Ayrton Senna's contract at Lotus to finish for the start of 1988. Replacing the retired Keke Rosberg, Swede Stefan Johansson had already proven to be a steady hand in Formula 1, having scored six podiums over the last two years with Ferrari. With McLaren, he did an excellent job as the team's number two driver. McLaren were not on the pace and Alan Prost did not retain his championship, but the pair put up a good fight. Stefan Johansson got five podiums and finished sixth in the championship. This helped McLaren to second in the constructors and happily awaiting the arrival of Senna. Stefan Johansson left, but it was all downhill after McLaren. He raced for Ligier, Onyx, AGS, and finally Footwork. He had little to no success outside of a surprise podium with Onyx, but would win Le Mans in 1997. Number 20, Jochen Mass. Mass replaced Mike Hellwood in 1974 for the last two rounds and was kept on for the next three years. He would take his only Formula 1 win in Spain in 1975 as well as three podiums, followed by two more podiums in 1976 and another two in 1977. Despite this, he never really finished that high in the championship. 1977 was his best year with sixth in the championship but he was always the number two driver being teammate to Emerson Fittipaldi in 1975 and James Hunt in 1976 and 1977. After leaving McLaren, he'd race for a few more years of ATS, Arrows and March and would later have success in sports car racing. Number 19, Carlos Sainz Jr. His podium at Brazil 2019 was McLaren's first since both Jensen Button and Kevin Magnussen finished on the podium at the 2014 Australian Grand Prix and Sainz alongside Lando Norris started a McLaren renaissance, with the team getting their best results for a long time. While Sainz had a difficult start, after a while he was consistently scoring points in both his seasons with the team and finishing 6th in the championship in both 2019 and 2020. This was a massive step up from his time with Toro Rosso and Renault, where he had also been very consistent but the cars lacked the pace of the top teams. After leaving McLaren after 2020, he joined Ferrari, has scored multiple podiums, along with his first ever win in Formula 1 at the 2022 British Grand Prix. Sainz has been a great driver wherever he has gone, and still has more to do in Formula 1. Number 18, Fernando Alonso. A driver who has had two spells at McLaren, surprising as his first spell was incredibly toxic for the team and Alonso fled back to Renault afterwards. 2007 should have been Fernando Alonso's year. He had won the last two championships and had the best car in the field. But in fighting and shenanigans with rookie teammate Lewis Hamilton, cost Alonso and the team the Drivers' Championship with Kimi Raikkonen stealing it out from under them. Alonso won four races that year and these would be the only four races he would win for McLaren. He returned to the team in 2015 and with the new Honda engine had his worst year in Formula 1 outside his debut with Minardi in 2001. He only scored points at two races and finished 17th in the championship. The next three years were slightly better, but Alonso never finished higher than fifth in a race and only scored a smattering of points. With his best year on his return was 2016, when he finished 10th overall. He left after 2018 and tried and failed to win the Indy 500 with McLaren, but did win the 24 hours of Le Mans with Toyota. He returned to Formula 1 with Alpine in 2021, and in 2023 will be racing with Aston Martin. He has started more F1 races than anyone ever, and there is no sign of him stopping anytime soon. Number 17, Juan Pablo Montoya. I really like Juan Pablo Montoya, but his time in Formula 1 was distressingly short. After a successful stint at Williams, he joined McLaren in 2005, and his year and a half with the team was met with plenty of controversy. There was points at the start of the season, but he injured his shoulder playing tennis and missed a couple of races. 
He was penalised for causing a crash at the Monaco Grand Prix. He was also disqualified in Canada for leaving the pit lane under a red light. By the end of the year, he was more at peace with his car and took two wins and five podiums in the last seven races and finished fourth in the championship. In 2006, things started to fall apart. He already knew he was going to be replaced with 2007 and Montoya underperformed, had a lot of reliability issues and the final straw was the crash at the US Grand Prix. In the year since, he has raced in NASCAR, IndyCar and the IMSA and has been very successful. Number 16, Peter Revson. The final driver of part two is Peter Revson, who took two wins for McLaren in 1973 and spent his only two full seasons with the Woking based team. He had already won the 1971 Can-Am series for McLaren and actually made his debut in Formula 1 in 1964 in a self-entered Lotus. He didn't return until 1971 with Tyrrell, but he only made a couple of appearances before joining McLaren in 1972. He managed to get a few podiums and finished fifth overall before scoring his two wins in 1973 and again finishing fifth. He joined Shadow for 1974 and failed to finish his first two starts. He was then killed in a crash in practice for the South African Grand Prix at the age of 35. Number 15, Gerhard Berger. I think it's fair to say the Austrian was a bit of a workhorse, a long career in Formula One and always a solid driver. He drove for McLaren between 1990 and 1992 and in his three years he was there to be deputy to superstar driver Ayrton Senna. And he did an incredible job. He was already very experienced, having driven for ATS, Arrows, Benetton and Ferrari, taking four wins with the Scuderia and Benetton's first ever win at Mexico in 1986. He was close friends with McLaren teammate Ayrton Senna and worked as backup to him superbly, helping McLaren to two Constructors' Championships in his time there. In 1990, he struggled with a car that was too small for him, having been designed around the slighter frame of Alain Prost, even so, he took multiple podiums and finished the year fourth. He finished fourth again in 1991, but also took his first win for the team at the Japanese Grand Prix. McLaren dropped behind the Williams team in 1992, but Berger still won two races, before heading back to Ferrari and later Benetton, before retiring after 1997. He's been involved in motorsport ever since. Number 14, Bruce McLaren. The founder of the company, and really it's Bruce McLaren's vision, that is still integral to the DNA of the modern McLaren team. Its first ever driver debuted the team in Formula 1 all the way back in 1966. The first couple of years were very much development years, even using Serenissima engines for one race. The McLaren project didn't come good until 1968 when Bruce McLaren took the team's first win at Spa. The team also finished second in the championship to Lotus. That win would prove to be the last for Bruce McLaren he got several podiums in 1969 and finished third in the championship. In 1970, he finished second at Kailami, but sadly, he was killed driving a Can-Am car at Goodwood and his team would have to continue on without him. Five years later, the team would be a championship winning one and as of 2022, has won 12 drivers championships and eight teams championships, all because of one Kiwi starting his own team in 1966. Number 13, Lando Norris. From the very first to one of the newest entries on this list, Lando Norris is very much the future of Formula 1 but has already been very impressive for McLaren. He has very much led the modern revolution that saw the team rise from the ashes of the Honda engine deal and start their long march back up to the front of the grid. After finishing runner-up in Formula 2 for Carlin in 2018, Norris was promoted to Formula 1 with McLaren for 2019. His first year he was dominated by teammate Carlos Sainz Jr but he did score regular points and helped McLaren to the best of the rest status in fourth. In 2020, he took his first podium at Austria and got even closer to Sainz, who left for Ferrari and was replaced by the experienced Daniel Ricciardo. 2021 was the year of Norris. He took his McLaren and for half the season, he was fighting for third in the Drivers' Championship. The one thing that evaded him was a win. He followed teammate Ricardo home at Monza for a McLaren 1-2 and Russia he almost won but the rain came and demoted him to 7th. He had taken his first pole position and got fastest lap. He finished the year 6th in the standings and well ahead of Daniel Ricardo. a result he managed a second time in 2022. What's astonishing about Norris is he's only retired from 8 of his 82 races. That consistency in scoring points served him well at the length of the season. The next step is a race win, and that's not an impossibility for Lando Norris. Number 12, Jensen Button. 
I forgot how long Jensen Button was at McLaren. I thought it was just a footnote to his career after winning the championship with Braun, when in actual fact only one driver has driven in more Grand Prix for McLaren than Button. He joined the team after the title win and immediately it was clear this was not the McLaren of a couple of years previously. Even so, Button won two of his first four races and ended the year fifth. 2011 was his best year. Sebastian Vettel dominated the title, but Jensen was best of the rest and is one of the few drivers to have beaten Lewis Hamilton as his teammate. He was actually the first of three to do this, with Nico Rosberg doing it in 2016 and George Russell in 2022. Button took three wins in 2011. He was on the podium at 12 races and still finished 122 points behind Vettel. In 2012, he took three more wins, which would be his last in Formula 1, and finished the season two points behind teammate Hamilton, who left for Mercedes, and thus began McLaren's descent to the back of the field. In 2013, he was ninth. 2014, he was eighth and took his final F1 podium. Both these years, he beat his younger teammates. In 2015, McLaren got Honda power and were truly a backmarker team, even with the championship winning duo of Jensen Button and Fernando Alonso. Button beat Alonso in 2015, but Alonso returned the favour in 2016, and Button left Formula 1 after a 16-year career, with his worst championship finish since his season with Benetton in 2001. He made one final appearance in 2017, standing in for Alonso, and now runs his own race team. Number 11, David Coulthard. And now the driver who took part in the most races for McLaren in an incredibly long career. Of his 15 seasons in Formula 1, Coulthard and his really large chin spent 9 of those with McLaren and was with the team as they hit their peak in the late 90s. Coulthard took 12 of his 13 Formula 1 wins with McLaren. He joined after leaving Williams in 1996 to partner Mika Hakkinen and the pair would be teammates for the next 6 seasons until Hakkinen retired. 1996 was only McLaren's second season with Mercedes engines and the development process was still ongoing. Ferrari and Williams were the ones fighting for the championship and David Coulthard would have to settle for a couple of podiums and seventh overall. 1997 started with Coulthard taking his first win for the team at the opening round. McLaren was still not on pace with the top teams, but Coulthard did beat teammate Mika Hakkinen in the final standings and ended the year third. McLaren took the team's title in 1998, as of 2022 the last time they won it. And Coulthard backed up teammate Hakkinen with a win at Imola and six second places. He added two more wins in 1999 and three in 2000. 2001 was dominated by Michael Schumacher, but David Coulthard finished runner-up in the championship again ahead of Hakkinen. The next three years didn't produce anything special for Coulthard, just two more wins and fifth, seventh and tenth in the championship. Coulthard left McLaren to finish his career at Red Bull. He had a stint in the DTM which didn't produce any great results and he's now a TV pundit. Number 10, Kimi Raikkonen. The 2007 Formula 1 world champion was once considered too young for Formula 1. Amazing seeing as he retired as the most experienced driver ever, and even more amazing is that he debuted for Sauber in 2001, having only raced in 23 car races previously. After a solid debut year, he replaced his friend and mentor Mika Hakkinen at McLaren, and for a few years was an outside contender for title contention. His first season was again solid, finishing just behind teammate David Coulthard. The Finn would then beat his experienced teammate over the next two years, finishing runner-up in the championship in just his third season in Formula 1. After a disappointing 2004, Raikkonen bounced back to finish runner-up to Fernando Alonso in 2005, ahead of Michael Schumacher in the final standings and winning seven races. McLaren weren't as competitive in 2006 and Kimi Raikkonen took no wins. He left for Ferrari, won the championship, went off to do rallying for a bit, came back with Lotus, rejoined Ferrari and then ended his Formula 1 career with Alfa Romeo. He hasn't done a lot in 2022, just one NASCAR race, but I do miss the Iceman and his time at McLaren was all too brief. Number 9, John Watson. For someone who turned out at McLaren at completely the wrong time, John Watson definitely made an impression. When he replaced James Hunt in 1979, McLaren had come to an end of a strong period and was starting to slip down the field. John Watson, meanwhile, had worked his way up from Goldie Hexagon Racing to a surprise race win with Penske in 1976 and now a McLaren drive. McLaren finished 7th in the Constructors in 1979, with Watson scoring their only points. They did even worse in 1980, dropping to 9th. Watson still beat young, inexperienced teammate Alain Prost. 1981 didn't start great either, no points in the first 6 races, but then a 3rd in Spain, 2nd in France and winning his own race put him back near the top of the game. In 1982 he took 2 wins, 
winning from 10th on the grid in Belgium, before outdoing himself and winning the Detroit Grand Prix from 17th. After that race, he was actually leading the championship, but ended the year third. In 1983, he started 22nd at Long Beach with teammate Nicky Lauda in 23rd. They finished first and second. After 1983, John Watson left Formula 1, making a single appearance in 1985 in place of Lauda. John Watson was at McLaren between two golden periods and still gave him some great moments, a fantastic driver who sadly seems to get forgotten in most great driver debates. Number 8, James Hunt. For a guy who apparently didn't like racing very much, he was sure good at it. I think the most incredible thing about James Hunt is the results he got for Heskiff. Heskiff weren't in Formula 1 for long, just five and a bit seasons from 1973 to 1978. James Hunt took a win, eight podiums and scored a total of 62 points for the team. No one else ever scored for them. It's not like they rounded up some fat middle-aged drunk blokes from the local bar. From experienced racers like Guy Edwards and Ian Ashley, to some of the best in Alan Jones and Eddie Cheever, Hunt was incredible, but he liked the booze and the ladies and racing was always kind of secondary to him. That's why his career at the top is so short, and there's nothing after 1979. After leaving Heskiff with a 4th place finish in the championship in 1975, he joined McLaren for 1976, and if you have seen the film Rush, you know what happened that year. Hunt won 6 races whilst rival Nicky Lauda had a horrifying accident at the Nürburgring that took him out for just a couple of races, and after Lauda pulled out the final race, James Hunt won the championship. What you may know less about is his final few years in Formula 1. In 1977, the car was unreliable in the early part of the season and Hunt struggled against his rivals. He got two race wins late in the year, but it wasn't enough to close the gap and he ended the year fifth. In 1978, McLaren's rivals pulled further ahead and Hunt had a torrid year, scoring just eight points. He left McLaren for Walter Wolf Racing in 1979. He didn't score any points and retired from most races. After accidentally breaking the drive shaft in Monaco, he announced his retirement from racing. He did commentary, racked up huge debts, and died in 1993. Number 7, Denny Holm. The second ever McLaren driver was Kiwi Denny Holm. He was the complete opposite of James Hunt. He lived to race, and raced in nearly every category of motorsport available. He won the Formula 1 title with Brabham in 1967, and joined Bruce McLaren in 1968. Denny Holm was usually the quicker of the two drivers and had a lot of success in McLaren's early days. Two wins in his first season and third in the championship. A win at Mexico in 1969, four podiums and fourth overall in 1970. 1971 was a bad year but McLaren bounced back in 1972 with Holm winning in South Africa and taking six podiums through the season. Once again finishing third overall. In his final two years, he took two more wins and left, just as teammate Emerson Fittipaldi took the team's first drivers' championship. Denny Harm also won two Can-Am titles for McLaren, and in the years after F1, raced in pretty much everything, including trucks. He passed away whilst racing in the Bathurst 1000 in a BMW M3 in 1992. Number 6, Nicky Lauda. The interesting case of Nicky Lauda and McLaren, a massive coup for McLaren as the very successful Austrian had already retired from Formula 1, after a terrible 1979 with Brabham, where he retired from almost every race. After a couple of years on the unemployment line, picking up fag butts off the floor and drinking leftovers in his local pub, Lauda came back to Formula 1, joining McLaren in 1982. It looked like he had not lost any of his speed, the two-time champion with 17 F1 wins behind him, won on his third start back at Long Beach. He also won the British Grand Prix and finished fifth overall. He started 1983 with two podiums, but it was a bad year, and Lauda retired from almost every race. He retired a lot in 1984 as well, but he did also take 5 wins and 3 second places and the 1984 Formula 1 World Championship, the third of Lauda's career. His final year in 1985 was also very disappointing, a lot of retirements, and only 10th overall in the standings, but he did take his 25th and final Grand Prix win. He left McLaren as the new generation took over, Sun Alain Prost and eventually Ayrton Senna would take the helm, and lead the team to new heights, but old man Lauda did a damn good job for the team. Number 5, Lewis Hamilton. This is going to be contentious because I know a lot of his diehard fans would demand he be number 1, but Hamilton's time at McLaren is not actually that good looking back. Understandable as he was young, and it was the beginning of McLaren's downfall, but for every up, there are some pretty damning downs. If you somehow forgot, most of his success came at Mercedes, not McLaren. That being said, his debut in 2007 was something to behold. 
he instantly got to grips with Formula 1 and put the challenge to his double champion teammate, only losing out to bad luck more than anything. 2008 was less impressive in my opinion. Despite winning the championship, he made very hard work of it, only just seeing our Ferrari number 2 driver, Felipe Massa, literally winning by a corner. After that, things took a turn for the worse. McLaren struggled with the new regulations in 2009 and Lewis floundered in a car that was not capable of running at the front. The car got better as the year went on, but Lewis was never really in contention. Over the next few years, he finished 4th, 5th, then 4th again. He lost out to teammate Jensen Button in 2011, and over the three years as teammates, Button scored more points. Lewis left McLaren for Mercedes after 2012 and the rest is history. I don't think he's ever likely to return to McLaren, so his championship win in 2008 and the 21 wins he took with the team are what brings him to fifth on this list. Number four, Emerson Fittipaldi. The first McLaren driver's champion, Emerson Fittipaldi joined the team from Lotus in 1974. He was already a champion in 1972 and had finished runner-up in 1973. He won his home race in just his second start for McLaren and took two other wins and four podiums to take his second championship and McLaren's first. In 1975, he won in Argentina and Britain but lost out in the championship to Nicky Lauda. He finished in the top two places four years in a row in Formula 1 with Lotus and McLaren, but seemingly at the peak of his career and the world at his feet, Fittipaldi shocked everyone by leaving McLaren for his older brother Wilson Fittipaldi's automotive team. He would race for the family team for five years and would take a few podiums but had little success. He won the kart series and the Indy 500 in 1989 and now watches his many family members come and go from Formula 1. He may have had only two years at McLaren, but his incredible talent can't be denied. Number three, Alain Prost. The French Formula One legend who would go on to be a four-time Formula One champion made his debut with McLaren in 1980. Alain Prost joined the team at a bad low point and struggled to score points, taking just five all year and finishing 16th overall. In the next 12 years, he'd never finished lower than fifth. He left for Renault in 1981 and if he had left it there, Prost would have been much lower on this list. After taking nine wins in three years of Renault, he returned to McLaren in 1984. Despite taking a record equaling seven wins, Prost finished runner-up to teammate Nicky Lauda by just half a point. This was because of the infamous Monaco Grand Prix and the controversial finish that saw Jackie X rave the red flag without telling anyone, and half points were rewarded. Prost won with the Tolman of Ayrton Senna behind. In 1985, he became the first ever French Formula 1 champion, well clear of his rivals, and he won it again in 1986, although he was very lucky as Nigel Mansell looked like he was going to win when a tyre blew in the final race at Adelaide. In 1987, McLaren had an underpowered and unreliable engine. Prost got the best out of it and took three wins, but did not win the championship. He did take his 28th win that year, which at the time was the record. In 1988, he was joined by Ayrton Senna, at Prost's insistence, which he may have eventually regretted. McLaren dominated winning all but one race, and Prost even finished in the top two spots at all but two races. And this cost him the championship. In 1988, only the best 11 results counted, which is dumb, and that gave the title to Senna. Frankly, Prost should have won two more titles than he did. He won another title for McLaren in 1989, but even this was controversial. Prost felt Honda favoured Senna over him, a lot of animosity grew between the pair, and at the Japanese Grand Prix they collided. Senna continued but missed the chicane and was disqualified. Prost left McLaren for Ferrari and after getting sacked in 1991 he joined Williams, won the title in 1993, retired and started his own Prost F1 team. It was bad and the professor left F1 for good. Number 2 Mika Hakkinen The Finns survived two terrible years with the Lotus team before joining McLaren in 1993. Hakkinen impressed during test sessions and replaced the unfortunate Marco Andretti for the last three Grand Prix of the year, taking a podium in Japan. He spent the next eight years with McLaren, but it was a few years before they had a car that was capable of taking race wins. In 1994, Hakkinen took his Peugeot-powered McLaren to six podiums, but the car broke down a lot and Hakkinen only finished fourth overall. Things were even worse in 1995 with the new Mercedes engine. A lot of retirements and two second places was only good enough for seventh in the championship. 1996 was the start of an upturn in fortunes for Hakkinen and McLaren. They were far more reliable than the previous couple of years and finished on the podiums a few times towards the end of the season. 1997 wasn't great in terms of results, but Mika Hakkinen did take his first Formula 1 win at the final race of the year at Jerez. 
But in 1998, Hakkinen took eight wins over the course of the year and was well clear of Michael Schumacher. 1999 was a crazy year for Formula 1, with Schumacher missing rounds through injury and Eddie Irvine being good for one year only. Hakkinen came out on top again as Formula 1 moved into the new millennium. McLaren couldn't compete with the dominant Ferrari. Hakkinen took four wins and finished one-up in 2000 before a final two wins in 2001. After this, he retired, briefly returning to racing in DTM in the mid-2000s, taking three wins for Mercedes. And number one, Ayrton Senna. Of course, the number one McLaren driver is Brazilian legend Ayrton Senna. His 35 wins for McLaren are more than anyone else managed, and he too won three championships. In just six years with McLaren, he accomplished more than anyone else. After heroic performances in a Tolman and six wins with Lotus, Senna joined McLaren in 1988. He had some hard-fought battles with Prost, as previously mentioned, and came out on top in his first season, finishing runner-up in 1989. In 1990, with Alan Prost gone from the team, Senna took six wins and the championship, but it did end in controversy again. Prost, now at Ferrari, was Senna's main challenger. They tangled in Japan for the second year in a row, this time giving Senna the title. In 1991, Senna won the first four races and saw off Nigel Mansell for his third title in four years, but that was the end of McLaren dominance. Williams were the team to beat for the next couple of years. Senna finished behind Mansell, Petrazzi and Schumacher in 1992 and lost out to rival Prost in 1993. In 1994, he jumped to Williams and was sadly killed at Imola. The legend of Ayrton Senna is unlikely to ever be topped and he is the greatest McLaren driver ever. So that was the list of the best McLaren drivers to have ever raced for the team in Formula 1. Where will Oscar Piastri fit into this list? And will Lando Norris ever take a race win? Maybe a championship? Only the future will tell. Got to say it was a hard choice for the order of this video. All 15 of these drivers have done great things in Formula 1. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, have a Merry Christmas, thank you for watching and have a good one.